unto his name. How we praise God for this very significant and special conference that calls us together again to look at the importance, the relevance, the sound and biblical teaching that helps us to be the people of God that we've been called upon to be for such a time as this. The evident and esteemed pastor of this church, our convener, and our host for these nights that we spend together. The person is Reverend Dr. C.L. Baptist. How I thank God for him, for his visionary leadership of the people of God, not just here at the Mount Zion Church, but likewise in our national work and everywhere that God calls upon him to give service and leadership. Church family, you are blessed to have this man of God as your
But the time desires to shed a cut tonight, I want to talk from the subject going to the next level. All right. All right. Going to the next level. Yeah. Those words have been somewhat of a cliche over the past several years in church settings, even such as these. Mm -hmm. Everybody's talking about going to the next level. All right. All right. If going to the next level wasn't good enough, then certain folks start saying we're going to the next dimension. All right. All right. Everybody's All right. trying to move to this next place, this yeah. next space, this place that seems to be beyond our reach, but a possibility nonetheless. Yeah. Yes, sir. Going to the next level has been kind of a buzzword catchphrase yeah. right. Yeah. over the past several years because we've understood that when we look through the scriptures, Seems to me, seems to suggest to me that from the scriptures we understand that this God of ours yeah. never expects of us that we would be complacent and comfortable in the places in which we find ourselves. Uh, yes, sir. That God has never shown himself to be one who is stagnant and stymied and stifled by the realities of life. Right, right. That God is always up to something. Yes, sir. God is always, always. doing something. Yeah. God is always making progress and ensuring yeah. productivity. Yeah. You never see in Scripture God sitting around yeah. twiddling his thumbs, right. idly sitting by trying to figure out what's the next move. Right. 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 God is always up to something. Yeah. God is always making progress, ensuring productivity. God is a God of movement. Yeah. Yeah. God is a God of activity. God is a God of progress. And it right. seems to me, my beloved, right. that if we claim to be children of God, right. we ought to look a little like our dad. We ought to be people of progress. Right. We ought to be people of movement, people of activity, people right. who are interested in going somewhere, right. in doing something, in making some headway so that we can look back over our lives and see that we didn't just sit around as believers. But that we did something to expand and enhance the kingdom of God. All right, son. All right. I like the Bible, don't you? Yeah. The Bible gives to me a beautiful picture of a God who is always up to something. I mean, you don't have to read too far in Scripture to see your God in activity. Just read the first page and you'll see him doing some wonderful things. Just on the first page, he's always up to something. On the first day, he did this. And on the second day, he did that. And on the third day, he, he's always up to something. God is always about ensuring productivity and progress. And if we're going to look like a man, we ought to be people of progress and productivity. We ought to be people of movement and activity. Never satisfied with what happened yesterday and last week and last month and three years ago. Never complacent. Because we did something nice 10, 15 years ago. Never excited simply to rest on our laurels because in 1952 we did a great thing. No, God is up to something. And if God is up to something, we ought to be up to something. Every now and then, God stretches us yeah. to move past the places of complacency and stagnation to a place that would literally astound us, blow our minds, yeah. if we would simply put our trust in Him. Yeah. That's what it seems like the text is suggesting to us tonight as we look at Luke chapter 5. Yeah. After Jesus has left the wilderness experience and after having been in that wilderness experience fasting wow. for 40 days and 40 nights, he is tempted of the devil. The devil challenges him at three different places. Yeah. Yeah. And every time the enemy challenges him at those three different places, he responds in the same manner. He says, it is written. Yeah. 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 He attacks him. He gets yeah. back at him. Not by the same mode of attack that the enemy uses with him. No, he comes back at him with the word. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Against principalities and powers. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. And as a consequence, we need some word to work with us and work for us. So we might be able to counter the attack of the enemy. Read chapter 4 when you get a chance. Since I know as Christian educators and leaders of the Lord's church, since I know you read your Bible every day. Check out Luke chapter 4 when you get a chance and you'll see this consistent refrain about how powerful and how prominent the word of God is on the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, after he left the temple, after he left 
the, the wilderness being tempted of the devil, the Bible says that the spirit led him now back in power to come into what was known as the synagogue. And when he got to the synagogue, the Bible says he went there on the Sabbath day as was his custom. Yes, right. yeah. That Jesus, the master's lamb of God, went to church yeah. with regularity and consistency. Yeah. Jesus, the man who knew no sin but became sin, went to church every time church was going on. Yeah. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was his custom. And if Jesus needed to go to church, yeah. you get my point before I even get that motion. If Jesus had to go to church and he was the sinless son of God, you know you and I need to be in church as often as the church doors open. Here is Jesus who was in the synagogue on the Sabbath day and before anything else can take place, he takes the scroll from the minister. He opens it up to Isaiah chapter 61. He begins to read from the scroll. He says the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the Recovery of sight to the blind and set the captive free to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. The Bible says that all the eyes of them in the synagogue were fastened on him. As he finished, he gave that scroll back to the minister after rolling it up and he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing. He said, the one you've been looking for is the one you're looking at. You've been waiting on the Messiah, here I am. You've been waiting on the promised one, here I am. You've been waiting on the Redeemer, here I am. And the Bible said they couldn't take their eyes off of him. Because verses 32 and 36 says that his word was with power and authority. Every time he preached, his word had power. Every time he spoke, his word had authority. We don't know the style of the preaching of Jesus. We just know that every time he opened his mouth, folk were captivated. Every time he opened his mouth, folk couldn't stop listening to him. Every time he opened his mouth, folk couldn't stop listening and looking because there was something about his words that had power and authority. And every time we stand to preach or teach the word of God, we ought not do so in some haphazard form. We ought not do so in some lackadaisical form. But when you get in touch with the Holy Ghost, you want to have some power. Yeah. Do that which has been called upon you. Do here is Jesus who has returned in the power of the Spirit. Yeah. And his words right. have power yeah. and authority. Right. 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 That's what happens in Luke chapter 4. Right. Now, I'm not preaching about Luke chapter 4 today. I just want to give you some information. You need to have some context yeah. to appreciate the text. Yeah. I always tell preachers, if you ever take the text out of its context, all you're left with is a con. Yeah. We're not trying to con the people, we're trying to get them get up the people to understand the way and the will and the word of the living God. And here is Jesus, now having returned in the power of the Spirit, and when he comes back, he speaks in the synagogue, and everybody's got their eyes fastened on him, and he finds out something very quick. When you look at chapter 4 in its entirety, you'll find out that although some folk will be thrilled with your preaching, uh, other folk will be threatened by your preaching. Uh, Let's be real clear. Everybody ain't happy because you're at the conference tonight. Uh, Everybody not excited because you're trying to hone your skills and develop the gift that God has given to you. Some folk will be thrilled, but other folk will be threatened. They tried to get rid of Jesus in Luke chapter 4. Uh, he escaped their grasp. He eluded their grasp. And the text says now. When chapter 5 opens up, he makes his, his, his presence known. He, he re reappears on the scene. And when he does, he shows up at the lake of Genesaret. He shows up at this place, also known as the Sea of Galilee. When he gets to the lake of Genesaret, the Sea of Galilee, he finds some weary and forlorn fishermen. They are on the shore of the sea. And the Bible says they are washing their nets. They've been out there, according to the text that I read in your hearing tonight, they've been out there all night long. As a consequence of their fishing, doing what they've been trained to do, doing what they know how to do. The Bible says that while they're out there, they catch absolutely nothing. Here they are. Here they are in a bad situation. Yeah. The Bible says that as a consequence of this long night of fishing, yeah. as a consequence of all that took place, yeah. these gentlemen come back to the seashore 
on the next morning. Yeah. And when they come back to the seashore on the next morning, the Bible says that they have caught absolutely nothing. You've got to see this picture. Please don't miss it. These are trained fishermen. These are expert fishermen. This is not their first rodeo. They've done this before. They've been out there before and they've had some effectiveness with the work of fishing. But on that last night, they caught absolutely nothing. And so the Bible says that when Jesus encounters them, they are on the seashore washing their nets. It's a sign of finality. All right. I'm done. I feel like this no more. Sick of this. Didn't accomplish what I thought I was going to accomplish. Didn't I gain what I thought I was going to gain? This makes no sense. Words of Fanny Lou Hamer, I'm sick and tired. Of being sick and tired. I'm done with this. I'm finished with all this fishing. Doesn't make sense to be this trained, this effective, this experienced, and not have the success I thought I was going to have. Have you ever been there? Well, you thought for sure you were going to have some effectiveness because you've always been doing it. You've always been in this in this role. You've always done this work and as a consequence of knowing your experience, you thought that for sure you would have more effectiveness than you have had in time gone by. There will be some times, no matter how brilliant you think you are, no matter how successful you have been in time gone by, there will be some moments that creep up in your life that don't yield you the results you were looking for. The folk won't respond or even show up. And as a consequence, you can be on the Sea of Galilee with your nets in your hand in a sign of finality, I'm sick of it. I'm done. I ain't teaching another class. I ain't going no more. Maybe you heard of that Old Testament prophet by the name of Jeremiah. He felt like that one day, didn't he? Oh, Jeremiah said they're not listening to me. They won't do what I tell them to do. I'm sick of them. I'm sick of them. They're sick of me. I'm sick of them. We all see each other. I'm not going no more. And just as soon as he got ready to sit down, Same family. And every now and then, no matter how 
expert you seem to be, there will be some moments where you don't get the results you expected to receive. Here in the text, the Bible says these brothers have failed in their trial. And Jesus sends them out there to do it again. He says, I know last night didn't yield what you wanted to yield. I know you don't like what took place last evening. But go back out there and do it again. Could it be that some of us are missing out on some of the precious promises and the bountiful blessings of the Lord because we are so busy being consumed by the failures of our past? Could it be some of us are missing out on going to the next level because we're so stuck on what happened yesterday that we can't even fathom the fact that God is up to something today? Could it be that we're so angry so defeated about what happened last time right. that we can't see that God is about to move in a different way this time. Yeah. Jesus said, I didn't ask you what happened last night. Yeah. I didn't ask you how you feel about what showed up in your boat last night or what didn't show up in your boat last night. Go back out there and do it again. And could it be that some of us are missing out on some of the precious promises and not the blessings of God, not simply because we're wrapped up in last night, but we also know that other folk know what happened. Whatever your last night was, I'm just saying there's some more who know what happened in your failures, failure moment last night. And because you know that they know what happened, you have crippled yourself, stymied yourself, stagnated yourself, and you cannot move forward to the place where God is trying to take you. Last time I checked your Bible, my failures, my faults. My frailties, even my finitude, cannot stop God from working in my life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And there, there will be some honest witnesses in the building tonight who can testify. I've not done everything properly. I've not made everything, everything go according to the way it was supposed to go. I've not done it every eye. I've not crossed every T. I know I got a title in church, but I made some failures and mistakes. I know I know people know my name. I know they think I'm the biggest saint in the sanctuary. But if the truth be told, come on, let's be honest. If somebody on your road knew your whole story, oh, they see you now that you all suited up and now that you got an iron in your lap. But if they knew your whole story, even six you've been saved, come on, let's be honest. I, I may not know a lot, but I know church folk, and I know there's some folk in here tonight. Testify, I made some egregious errors since I've been saved. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's about eight times in the room. 